All right, so for today, what we're going to talk about, uh, first thing, you know, solid waste in Vermont. We'll talk about facility certification and management plans. Jeff Bordeaux is going to fill us in on that. Go over landfill ban materials and our special recycling programs that we have in Vermont, um, extend producer responsibility. We'll touch on abandoned household hazardous waste. That's kind of one of those things that might need its own training. And then Frank is going to talk to us about inspections and common issues that he sees out there in the field when he's visiting your sites. And we're going to have questions at the end of each section, so please feel free to ask questions. If you're more comfortable putting them in the chat, you can do that, and then Anne can read them off. Um, and then we'll do a wrap up and share some resources. So here in Vermont, um, we have a six dollar per ton franchise fee that you're probably all familiar with. Um, that's on all waste generated in Vermont. It pays for my job um, and my colleagues that are sitting here with me doing this training. And it some of the things that we do here at the Solid Waste Program are we offer outreach and assistance. Um, we do inspections to ensure there's a level playing field for everybody, that everybody's managing waste safely. Um, we want to make sure we're protecting Vermont and managing all these materials the right way. Vermont has been doing a pretty good job of diverting recyclables and food scraps. However, we've been stuck at about 35% diversion. You could see this pie chart I have up on the screen. This is Vermont's trash in 2018, uh, the last waste composition study that we did. On average, we're throwing away about three and a half pounds per day, each of us, um, which is kind of a lot, you know, when you start to think about it. And we could do better and we could cut what we throw away by half. And, you know, and that's part of what we're all working to do here. Uh, Universal Recycling Law, which was passed in 2013, has been one of the main um, impetus behind getting us all to divert more. And as you know, we have a ban on recyclables, the common recyclables from being thrown away and also on food scraps. And this is good because not only does it save landfill space, but it decreases greenhouse gases. And we all are seeing the impacts of increased greenhouse gases are leading to, to climate change. Um, and things like our precious maple trees are are not going to be around much longer if uh, the climate keeps changing. So go forward here. Pictures of recyclables. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen these. These are pretty pictures of them once they're bailed after you all do all your hard work to get them there. Um, food scraps, again, another main piece trying to divert food scraps. If you all don't know who your solid waste management entity is, Please check out this map. You can go to 802recycles.com. These folks are a great resource for you if you're not already connected with them. They can help you um, do outreach to your customers, help you with managing household hazardous waste, connect you with various programs for diverting food scraps. And I believe we have some solid waste management entities on the call right now. These are the folks who manage the solid waste implementation plan for your region. And so they're helping to meet state requirements to manage waste properly. And that's my quick intro. And with that, I'm going to introduce Jeff Bordeaux, who's going to go over uh, facility certifications. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeff Bordeaux. A lot of you guys might know me, um, or I will probably meet you in the future. But uh, I've been with the agency 30 years and been in solid waste, so I get around the state quite a bit. I'm part of a group of four of us, um, Dennis Fecker, Casey Cathan, and Sarah Amatrudo. And we're responsible for certifying the facilities around the state. And we also, that's our, our title, but we also do a lot of um, outreach and also what I, I almost would say material management. People will call us, what do we do with this? What do we do that? We field a lot of calls. But uh, I'm just going to talk about two, two major things here, or three, the facilities themselves, the certifications and facility management plan. And why I say that is any facility we have in the state, you should have a certification on hand and then also your facility management plan. That's actually a requirement of our rules. But uh, before I get into that, what is a facility? I, I thought this might be interesting for you guys. Um, there are approximately 225 solid waste facilities in Vermont. 
the bulk of them are transfer stations. There's 117 of those. Uh, there's 50 recycling drop offs, which is just more of just taking recyclables, uh, not really handling waste itself. There's two uh, material recycling facilities, one in Rutland, one in uh, Williston, and then we have uh, two line landfills. One is Coventry, we're all familiar with that one, but then Omia, which is a private landfill with, um, down in uh, the Rutland area, and they, they just deal with uh, their manufacturing. I, I'm trying to think of what the material is, but uh, it's mined material, so it's not any solid waste that we say is municipal solid waste. There's three digesters. There's one depackager, which is one of our newest facilities that's in Williston, which takes recycling facility or uh, products off of shelves and, and push through the depackager and it, it separates the material from the packaging. And then we have five HHW, um, HHW collection centers. So all of these require certifications. So you have these certifications, it's just a background, because some of you guys just might be operating, but there's a whole application process. It takes between a month and a half to several years, several years being the landfill, one and a half months for a simple facility. So a lot of you walk in, there's been a whole history behind it. In the, in the application, there'll be the uh, owner, operator, who's gonna own it, who's gonna operate it. There's siting criteria, there's, uh, Areas to fill out on the amounts that you're going to accept of materials, the types of materials, uh, how much it would cost to close the facility. Um, that's important because, uh, particularly the privates, if for suddenly you go out of business, the state is holding money aside and so to help uh, close the facility um, so that it's not put onto the taxpayers. And then we have reporting conditions in the certification, and, and typically those are quarterly reports. I'm sure a lot of you have filled those out through Retrack. That's all in the certification. But the most important part of the certification is the facility management plan. And if written correctly, I'd say this is what I would call the operation manual. If you had a new employee come to your facility, if it's written correctly, they could pick up this facility management plan and they would know how, what time to open the facility, what types of material to, to pick up or to accept, uh, the equipment involved, the operator themselves, what their responsibility is, their safety plan, um, and then how much material they can store on the site at any one time. There's other things required in there, signage. Um, each facility is required to post their hours and then also banned materials. I mean, those are two, two areas where if there's a compliance check, that will be one of the first things checked off. Uh, in addition to that, I just going to wrap it up by saying you all have these documents at your site as required in the certification. And if things are slow, just pick them up and read through them. And then if you have any questions, give us a call. Or if you see that you guys are operating a facility that's not uh, included in your facility certification. I mean, if you're, you're doing activities, give us a call and we can always amend a certification and it's quickly and easily done. So I'm going to pass it back to me at this time. Uh, Thanks for your time, you guys. Next, you all should be familiar with this poster. If you don't have one of these at your facility, feel free to drop me an email after this. We'll make sure we get you one. It is a part of your certification to have this posted, and we're happy to provide these to you laminated. Here is um, all the landfill bans in Vermont in photo version. We used to have them just in writing, but we thought it was more helpful for people um, on the run. And, and, you know, if any of your customers get irritated with you, you can blame it on the state. Say, hey, listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's banned from the landfill. Um, and again, we're happy to provide these for you. Um, at any time, so just let us know. And then, you know, in conjunction with this, not only is it banned, but we've made sure that there's options for all of these materials to safely, you know, recycle or dispose of them the right way in Vermont. And so this waste not guide, again, we can provide these to you um, and you can give them out to your customers. Just let us know how many you'd like. Um, we can also provide the PDF um, 
you know, and, and get these brochures, these flyers out to your folks so they know what they can do with all the materials that are banned from the landfill. Again, um, recycling, a lot of questions about it. We tried to make a flyer that, you know, really just gets to the basics of what, you know, what needs to be recyclable and do these main recyclables and do them well, make sure they're clean and then leave all this other junk out because none of you want to be dealing with that. And I, we all know you are on a daily basis. Um, and so on the back side, it's no plastic bags, no batteries, et cetera. Again, we're happy to print these flyers and mail to you. Just please let us know and we'll get them out to you. All right, and next up we have Karen. Hello, my name is Karen Knabel. So these are five programs that we have in the state. They are manufacturer funded programs. We refer to them as special recycling. A lot of the facilities have picked up this terminology. It means it can't go in the trash, but it also can't go in the blue recycling bin. These programs are programs that are funded by manufacturers. They can be, you can participate in these programs. They are free to the public, and, and that's one of the, the beauties of them. I oversee three of these programs, and first I'm going to talk to you about the electronics program. Now, in the state, we do have landfill bans, meaning they can't go in the trash. And for electronics, the devices on the top of this poster are the ones that are free and paid for by the manufacturer. They would be labeled covered electronic waste if you were participating in this program, but there are other devices in the state that are also banned that are not part of the free program, and this is the list of those below. Certainly, I can give you more information about them, but they would be considered non-covered banned electronic waste if you were collecting them. So in the electronics program, it's pretty specific as to what's covered under the program. And a lot of people say, well, why can't you cover this device or that device? If you're participating in this program, uh, the devices are covered based on the manufacturers who pay for them. So manufacturers of computers, monitors, printers, televisions, and computer peripherals are the ones that pay for the program and that's why they're free. So computers, so we're talking desktops, laptops, tablets, and monitors of any type. Printers, all desktop printers, but not any floor models or even those that have an optional floor stand are not covered. Televisions of any type, the large CRTs and flat panel displays are covered by this program. And computer peripherals, which is basically anything that provides input or output from a computer. Now, when I say covered, those are the ones that if you're participating in the program that can be collected at no charge. Now this program, which is a little bit different in that these are drop off by customers, so we can't pick them up. And when your collection containers are full, they're picked up by a recycler. Some of these EPR programs are mail back, uh, paint and electronics are picked up by the recycler. So if you have any of those devices, computers, monitors, printers, televisions, or computer peripherals, they have to be dropped off by Vermont households, businesses with 10 or fewer employees, charities, or school districts. Important thing about this waste, if you are participating in the program and any of these people bring you electronics, they can bring them to your facility if you're if you are participating in the program and you can't refuse to collect them, even if they're outside of your area or outside of your district, and there's no limit for covered electronic devices. If they bring them to you and you are full up, you can schedule an appointment. Um, aside from that, anyone who brings in seven or fewer of these devices are also considered covered. So there's no seven limit on them. It's just if anybody brings in seven, you don't have to decide whether they're one of these covered entities. Basically, no big businesses. 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about Mercury. The Mercury program has been around for 20 years. We were the second state in the nation to have any kind of Mercury program. And back then, the largest contributor was coal-fired utilities in the Midwest. And, you know, just to kind of put that in perspective, those coal-fired utilities in Ohio, fumes from the, the um, coal would come right over in the jet stream. And so Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, of course, had lots of fish advisories related to mercury because of those coal-fired utilities. But what we started doing in the Mercury program was also focusing on products that contain mercury. And that's where you would be more familiar in the broken, broken items and the release of mercury into the environment. The thing about mercury, it's a very strange substance is in that it's a solid as a, a rock in the ground. It's mined out. Um, this rock is called cinnabar and it's a liquid liquid at room temperature and if you can see it's very dense uh, you can even float a pool ball in the in the liquid mercury and it is a gas that you can't see at room temperature um, and it continues to off gas so that's why it's important for us when we're managing these devices at end of life to really make sure that um, we manage them correctly and make sure that when, when at all possible that they don't break. For us in Vermont, one of the things that we always think about is the fact that the mercury gets into the environment and primarily it gets into the water bodies. It comes in, it interacts with bacteria um, in, in the bottom of the water body and it works its way up th through the food chain. And uh, this is where we can get a lot of exposure. And in Vermont, um, there is no water body that doesn't have some sort of an advisory for mercury. And so let's talk about the two mercury products that have these EPR programs that are funded by manufacturers. So the first one is thermostats. And the cool thing about these programs, as opposed to the electronics program, it, it's that we don't have a list of who it is. It's more of what you're bringing in. So anyone that's in the state of Vermont can bring any of these devices to one of the drop-off locations. Mercury thermostats, you can pretty much tell. Um, if you pull the cover off, you can see the ampule as it's pictured here. It has a free-flowing liquid inside. And mercury was used in a lot of products uh, like this because of its um, reaction to the temperature um, being you know, off-gassing at uh, room temperature and also that it conducts electricity. Now, we are one of two states in, in the nation that we also have the benefit of a $5 rebate. So the manufacturers not only pay for the shipping and the recycling of these thermostats, they also provide a rebate. And so there are different retail loca locations that collect, unlike the electronics, uh, retailers collect thermostats and the mercury bulbs, such as hardware stores. Wholesalers in the state are required to collect these. Wholesale and recycling facilities, if you participate in this program, there is a form that your customer fills out and places in a Ziploc baggie, and the manufacturer sends them a check, basically. Hardware stores, there's $5 coupon off the purchase of anything in the store. So it's an interesting program and there is an incentive. As far as the mercury bulbs, you know, we see a lot of those for the compact fluorescent bulb, screw base and pin base. There is no limit to the number of bulbs somebody can bring to you. Anything else, there's a limit of 10 per customer per day. So these are mostly going to be your linear, some YouTubes definitely here, but there is a 10 per customer limit. These are mailback programs, so you would be getting the boxes from the manufacturer, you would fill them up, and there's a one-year limit on all of these products that we're going to talk about because of the universal waste law in the state, and so you would have to mail them back within one year.
If you want more information about any of this, you can go to mercvt.org on the Mercury products. And my name is Karen Knabel at 802-522-5736. And if any of you have any of those uh, brochures that say EPR, free recycling, special recycling, that 800 number or that 8556 e-cycles on the front is also a number you can reach me at if anybody is interested in participating in any of these programs. All right, thank you. Okay, next up we have Todd Ellis. Todd is from Call to Recycle. Call to Recycle is a stewardship organization that represents the battery manufacturers and Battery manufacturers of single-use household batteries are required by Vermont law to set up a free um, collection program for residents to be able to recycle their batteries. And then, in addition, Call to Recycle runs a voluntary program for small rechargeable household batteries. And so they're able to collect both of these batteries from you all in one collection box and send for recycling. Um, so Todd is going to present on that program in Vermont and, you know, like the other materials that Karen was talking about, some of you are already collecting these and are familiar. Some of you are not. If you're interested in any of these programs and possibly joining, please reach out to us. Um, or if you're collecting those materials and not in the program, please reach out to us because um, we want to make sure you're doing it a safe way and also that your um, facility certification, that you have these materials listed on your facility certification. So, Todd, are you on? I am. Thank you for that introduction, Mia. Again, my name is Todd Ellis. I'm with the Call to Recycle program, um, and we are the official battery stewardship program uh, for the state of Vermont. Uh, next slide, please. So just quickly, sort of who Call to Recycle is. Uh, Call to Recycle is a nonprofit organization charged with keeping batteries out of the waste stream. Uh, we've been doing that. We've been collecting batteries since 1996 and recycled about 140 million pounds of batteries. Um, we're funded by battery and product manufacturers to assist them with keeping uh, them in compliance with the various regulations throughout the US. Uh, we also have a sister company in Canada. Um, in the U.S., it's we're primarily funded by the manufacturers to have a program, uh, battery take back and collection program across the U.S. Now we partner with existing collection sites. We don't own any sites, so we work with retailers. We work with uh, municipalities, transfer stations, swimmies to take batteries back at no cost to the collection site. Um, you know, this is just, and I won't spend a ton of time on, on this slide here, um, but I, I really like this picture, um, you know, obviously with the focus of the of the circular economy, um, this really just paints that picture. You know, if we start at 12 o'clock, you know, the program really starts with manufacturers who we call stewards, uh, who are voluntarily in many ways paying into our program and funding the collection of those batteries. Then it moves to consumers who, buy the products or batteries that they uh, that they create, um, you know, and then equipment's fulfilled and then the collection sites get those used batteries. Those used batteries then go to a battery sorter where they're separated out by chemistry and then they go to processors who then make them into new materials. Um, as Mia mentioned, Vermont has a primary battery stewardship law, which essentially means that the manufacturers of primary batteries um, or brand owners of primary batteries have to fund a take back and collection program for those batteries. Vermont's the only state in the U.S. at this point that has a battery stewardship law for primary batteries that's in effect. Washington, D.C. will kick in about this time next year in 2023, uh, but it's not functioning yet, so Vermont still holds that crown. Um, through our existing rechargeable battery collection, we're able to offer Vermont collection sites the ability to participate in Call the Recycle and take any consumer battery back. So both rechargeable battery and single use or primary battery are eligible for recycling at no cost in the state of Vermont. We have about 150 sites participating uh, in the state. 
Many of those are the swimmies um, and their collection facilities and sites, as well as many retailers and small businesses. Yeah, and I'm just going to chime in and tell folks uh, swimmies is this, you know, this abbreviation. It's solid waste management entities in case anyone doesn't know. So we're referring to the solid waste districts, the solid waste alliances, and then um, the independent towns that you all work with. So what can you recycle through the Vermont Battery Stewardship Program? So this is just a, a picture here. You can recycle any consumer battery, um, basically rechargeable battery under 11 pounds and a single use or primary battery under, it's technically 4.4 pounds. Um, the majority of batteries that you're gonna see now are batteries from power tools, um, batteries from you know kids riding toys like a Barbie Jeep, uh, which are sealed lead acid batteries. The power tools can be the old nickel cadmium batteries, which are heavy, or the lighter, smaller ones, which are lithium ion. Um, you'll see some laptop batteries and cell phones, but you'll the majority of batteries in Vermont that you're going to see are your your normal AA, A, C, D batteries. Um, you know, and obviously those have uh, a shorter life, right? So you you buy them today, you know they'll you'll be done with them and ready to recycle them in a couple of months versus a rechargeable power tool battery. It could be two years. Um, so as I mentioned, there are about 150 collection sites in Vermont that um, that participate in the call to recycle program. Uh, if you're not participating and you would like to participate in the collection program, you can visit our website. There's a link here that takes you to the sign up page. Um, all of our collection sites are required to complete our safety training, which basically is a base level of training on how to pack and ship batteries. Now that's a requirement for all collection sites, whether you're in Vermont, New York, Minnesota, California, that's just our base requirement. Um, and then once your site's completed that training, uh, you can, we'll ship you collection boxes, which also serve as a shipping box and you can start to collect used batteries. Here are some of the shipping boxes. Typically what you're going to get is what's on the left hand side, which is a nested battery recycling kit, which is uh, modeled after the, the Russian nesting dolls where there's one box inside the other. So we kind of ship two boxes in, in one package. Each of those hold about 40 pounds a box. They're rated up to 66 pounds. It's really difficult to even get close to that. The and then as Karen mentioned earlier, there is a spot on the back because these are considered universal waste where you can uh, fill in your accumulation start date. They come with prepaid labels, so they're super easy. They they come with plastic bags as well, which we'll get into here in a second. Um, so here is sort of the the cliff notes of how to properly handle and think about batteries that are coming into your facility. Every battery is going to hold a residual charge. Someone's going to walk in and I, we've all experienced like, okay, this thing's dead. It's not going to work anymore. Just go on with the assumption that, hey, there's some type of charge left in this battery. Um, also, when shipping batteries, there are certain types of batteries that require terminal protection. And terminal protection is a fancy word to or phrase to basically say that the the ends need to be taped the terminals need to be taped or they need to be individually bagged or taped now that's the typical message that we have for our national program you know which is strictly rechargeable batteries in vermont many of the single use batteries like your that, that you're going to see your a's uh your double a's triple a's c's d's nine volts the lantern batteries those batteries do not need to be terminally protected and that's a US Department of Transportation uh, perspective. As far as, you know, with our program, we have, um, we prefer individually bagging batteries when, uh, when applicable. Uh, we've tried, you know, you can use tape. We don't provide tape, we use bags. We have just found that tape walks away, frankly, uh, but you can tape them. You don't have to use, you don't have to do both. It's one or the other, and you can use clear packaging tape is, is probably your best option. As you can see, there's a, what used to be a FedEx, tri, uh, FedEx truck on fire on the side of a turnpike in Ohio. Um, that truck was carrying some of our collection boxes, as well as about four or five other battery recycling organizations or companies in their boxes. Um, so that 
day for us in 2017 really changed a number of things. And that is exactly what we're trying to avoid. Um, you know, as our mission is to collect batteries, it's also to do it as safely as possible. You know, and when we look at batteries, you know, the different types and, and sizes and, you know, there's a big, a, a, you know, big awareness now around batteries that are causing fires and the ones that are causing fires are lithium based batteries. Uh, and there's mainly two types of lithium based batteries and they're lithium primary or metal batteries and then lithium ion rechargeable. Um, the lithium primary batteries are the ones you see at the grocery store that are silver or blue um, and they, you know, for a four or six pack cost close to $30. Um, you know, it, they hold a lot of power. They are single use. They come in a bunch of different sizes. Um, you know, there are no recycling marks or recycling arrows, um, or, you know, there are some unique identifiers, but usually, you know, if they're sort of the, the stubby batteries, or if it's a battery that is that looks like a nickel, uh, or it's, uh, you know, silver and blue, those are lithium primary batteries. Lithium ion batteries are um, a little more distinguishable, uh, mainly because there are a number of different form factors that they come in that are somewhat unique, like power tools um, or cell phone batteries or laptop batteries. You know, obviously these are increasing market share over the last decade. You know, we're moving away a lot away from um, nickel cadmium, lithium ion, uh, excuse me, um, sealed lead acid over into the lithium ion space. Uh, there are some unique, unique identifiers on there. They're typically labeled lithium ion, and these batteries do typically have some type of re recycling arrows. The seal, which is in the lower left hand corner, which says RBRC recycle and 800 number, that's our re uh, recycling number. So, um, you know, if you find a battery that has that seal on it, you can certainly just put that in the collection box. One of the questions we're always asked is sort of what do these batteries come in? You can see it's cell phones, you know, those small cell phone chargers, tablets, laptops. They're moving into products that no one ever really anticipated they would move into. So like snow blowers, lawn mowers, you know, and it, it basically replacing gasoline, obviously power tools. Um, chainsaws and, and even the Energizer Bunny is now powered by lithium primary batteries. Next slide, please. Um, so an important piece in any battery collection program is basically having a plan. Um, you know, battery collection uh, is a great uh, is a great service to your residents or um, to your customers, you know, but it but it, you do need a plan. There are some batteries uh, like we mentioned that are causing causing fires. So better to have a plan in place uh, than not at all. So if you get any type of battery that's swollen, damaged, or if it's really hot or smoking, that battery cannot be placed in any normal collection bin. So those boxes I showed you earlier, they cannot be shipped in there. It's got to be shipped in a damaged, defective uh, battery shipping container. Um, typically, our recommendation is, is if you get one of these, is to place it in you know a cool, dry place and and put it in a bucket with sand, you know, kitty litter or cell block EX, which is a fire suppressant material. Um, so and at that point, that Battery cannot be shipped as a regular used battery. It's got to be shipped in a special container. We do have a number of these special containers, which you can basically take that damaged battery, package it up and ship it out just like you would a normal collection box. It's just got a number of different safety protocols in place. It's shipped in that material. I mentioned uh, cell block EX, which is a dry agent fire suppressant, which is made of 100% recycled glass. So if a battery starts to go um, and it goes into a thermal runaway in, in the battery industry, you're not allowed to say fire. So if it goes into a thermal runaway, then the it activates the beads, which look like Dippin' Dots, the ice cream that you get at any amusement park um, and it melts those beads and, and, and basically encases and suffocates the fire and absorbs the gas. Those are available. They're available on our website. Um, we actually did, and I know there is some crossover. We did a 10, we have a 10% coupon on um, coupon for NRRA members. Um, which I believe you can find on their website, which is uh, listed on if you look up batteries in their sheets, material sheets, you'll you'll find the code there. Uh, so any NRA members, there's a 10% discount uh, online code for that.
one of the areas that we're seeing sort of the highest growth uh, in lithium battery usage um, and as sort of the world becomes more electrified is the replacement of uh, of gasoline in many cases with battery. Um, you know, so like I said, products we never thought were going to be powered by batteries are now powered by batteries, whether that's commercial lawnmowers, snow blowers, chainsaws, and even uh, replacing people power and electric pedal assist bikes. Uh, the issue with these batteries are that once you get over that 300 watt hour level, it then becomes a hazardous material and it can't be shipped with your normal collection box. It has to be shipped in a special container. These batteries aren't part of the Vermont battery stewardship law since they exceed 300 watt hours. and They can't be, as I mentioned, shipped in that co normal collection kit. We do have a collection kit that's available for purchase. Um, if you do have these batteries, um, you know, the good news is they can be recycled. It's just a little tricky getting them there. Uh, they are being the recycling facility. You know, these batteries can be recycled through universal waste vendors. Uh, we did just kick off a program with uh, e-bike manufacturers uh, to properly handle and recycle e-bike batteries. So you can actually go on our website and you can go to our drop-off locator and you can look on the right-hand side. It talks about, it shows a couple different options and one of them is e-bikes. And you can click on e-bikes and put your zip code in and it will show you the closest uh, participating bike store where people can drop that off and you can direct your residents directly to that. Um, the other one that people are starting to see, mainly you know nickel metal hydride, uh, like the Prius batteries, uh, but some are starting to see the lithium ion as well is, you know, electric vehicle batteries, you know, and those it's really, I would encourage folks to con have the customer contact, you know, where they bought it. Um, so it, that's, that's a big one is, you know, contact the manufacturer. Many of them have programs. Um, you know, there are some folks out there that are taking EV batteries, but they, they need to be very specific ones and very specific, um, uh, paces. So uh, I would encourage everyone to just tell people to contact the manufacturer. Um, as I said, you know, one of the pieces is with battery collecting and, and collecting anything, quite frankly, is really having a plan. Um, and that, you know, our collection box does have um, a fire retardant liner in it. So, some, you know, if those of you participating in the program will see that the boxes have an actual liner um, kind of to serve as a safeguard. There is also on the right, uh, we refer to that as an EHS kit, and it's modeled after sort of an eyewash station and a uh, defibrillator. It's meant that closes, that folds together and hangs on the wall. And in case if there is a lithium ion battery fire, uh, there's a set of gloves that you put on and goggles and the uh, it's called a ped pad, which is in the upper left corner. You put over the over the battery, and then there's a fire blanket. Then then it goes over that. That doesn't allow it to spread. So the ped pad extinguishes the fire, and then the well that's doing that, the fire blanket maintains uh, the fire under it. Um, and there's also, as I mentioned, many different damaged and defective battery containers that are available. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. And next up, we are going to talk about paint, um, which some of you are collecting as a part of the paint care program, which is another manufacturer take back or product stewardship program in Vermont. Um, some of you are not currently collecting. Um, if that's something you might be interested in, you can talk with John Hurd, who is going to present right now. Um, and then again, make sure that's something that if you are collecting, it's on your facility certification and that you've had the training from paint care. Uh, on proper collection and sorting. So I will let John start talking. John, are you out there? I am. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do a quick overview. We're not going to get too deep into the weeds here, but I know there are some of you out there who are collecting paint and some who are not. So I want to make sure everybody's aware of the program, how it works, how to access it if you are not a collection site, um, how to become a collection site if you would like to become one, and so forth. So basically, we are a nonprofit that was set up by the paint industry to collect the paint, collect and recycle paint. Um, we're, board, we're governed by a board of architectural coatings manufacturers with oversight from A&R, because we are working with potentially hazardous waste here. 
So we set up collection sites at paint and hardware stores, household hazards, waste facilities, reuse stores, and transfer stations. And there are some bunch of videos on our website as well as a couple on the A&R website. Okay. So at this point, I'm not even have to count these. I believe we are at 11 states and we just started in New York last in May, just a couple months ago. So we're still working on surrounding Vermont, but we picked up Vermont or uh, New York, which is a big one. I also work in the Maine program. I'm actually in Maine right now. So we're working our way to cover all of the states, but not yet. So last year we collected well over 100,000 gallons of paint. Um, that's a pretty general, uh, generally our breakdown is about 75 to 80% latex and 20 odd percent oil-based. We're running 86, 86 year round drop off sites and another 50 plus household hazardous waste events that we help support. 77% um, of our total of the latex paint collected was recycled. And that goes right back to paint. Basically they color sort everything, dump it all together, filter out the chunks, add whatever they need to to get the consistency right and turn it into paint. Uh, Chittenden County Solid Waste with their local color program does a good percentage of that. Um, we really need to get more people working on trying to reuse reuse paint. That's been a weak point in our program. And we also have a large volume pickup program, and that's important, especially for sites that don't have the program. Um, anybody who has 100 gallons of paint or more can connect with us, and we will set up clean harbors to go pick up their paint from their site at no charge to them. So we have 86 um the paint drop off sites uh, most of those are, are paint retailers we have six transfer stations on one recycling center and four household hazardous waste facilities and actually that is up to five right now with the springfield household hazardous waste facility that just opened and as of last year every vermont resident lived within 15 miles of a drop off site so there should be somebody close to wherever you are that somebody can access. So as a quick overview, um, we basically take architectural sealers. So architectural coatings and seal, sealers. So basically any oil-based and water-based paint, stain, or varnish that's gonna go on or in a building. So that includes all the deck coatings and floor paints, all your primer sealers, undercoaters, all stains, all the clear coats like shellac, lacquer, varnish, and polyurethanes, um, the waterproofers like Thompson's water seal and concrete sealers and dry lock and that kind of fun things, as long as they're not tar based. Uh, metal coatings and rust preventatives, so basically rust oleum, as long as it's not in a spray can, and field and lawn paints. And I don't believe I put the stuff we don't accept in here because that's not really relevant today, but it's not a full household hazardous waste program. We can't take thinners, we can't take spray cans, we can't take automotive paints and boat paints and all of the other things that aren't actual paint in an original paint can. If you are a site, you will be on this locator. Obviously you won't be in, on, in the San Francisco map, um, but if you are not a site, you can send people to our website and you put in your zip code or your town, and it'll pop up all of the local sites around, give you their hours, give you any restrictions like transfer stations that only accept from their own towns or own districts, and that kind of thing. So if you're a transfer station and somebody comes in with paint, this is how you can help them find where to get rid of it. And again, so I'm on paintcare.org, and there's a button that says drop off paint. So yeah, we talked about large volume pickups and I had saw a comment pop up that said that that was good news. So again, go to paintcare.org, um, right on the main page, there's a big button that says um, schedule a pickup and that goes to an online form that I fill out with your information or you fill out, sends to me, I fill it back out and send it to Clean Harbors and they should have it cleaned out within about 10 days. Um, we also have a hotline, which is here and it's on all of our outreach materials, which I don't think I put a slide in here for. So anybody, um, if whether you're a drop-off site or not, can get pay, um, can get our outreach materials, like our brochures and mini cards, 
and that kind of thing to give to their customers for awareness of the program. Again, go to our website and um, follow some links to get to an order form where you can order outreach materials. And we have those in about a dozen languages at this point as well, if that's of interest. So what happens to the paint? As we talked about latex quickly, most of the latex is recycled as much as possible. Most of the oil base is used as fuel in hazardous waste furnaces and or um, like concrete production facilities. Um, so some there's a small amount of reuse, most of it's recycled, and there's some on some other uses like aggregates and precast products and so forth. I don't think any of Vermont's paint goes into those. Last slide. So there's my contact phone number and email. And again, paintcare.org is our website. And if anybody has any quick questions, I'd love to answer them. Don, this is Mia. I just wanted to chime in to give a shout out yep. for that large volume pickup program. Um, it seems to me that that is just, it's such a great service because it, it won't inundate the facilities. And it's so convenient for the person who may have the 100 gallons or more. Um, and we were just talking about here internally like maybe there's a way for us to get, put that on social media or something to let folks know yeah. about it um and yes and because it's a lot of the drop-off sites are at hardware stores and paint stores and they have a limited space and most of yep. those only take five gallons at a time so yep. if somebody has a basement full or a storage shed full it's going to take a long time to get to to bring it all through it's also a lot safer for clean harbors to transport a large quantity of paint in a lined box instead of bouncing around in the back of a pickup truck where you end up with those nice drip lines of paint down the middle of the road that I've, I've driven yeah. around in Maine. I've and seen at least two sets of those. Ease some of the burden on the one day household hazardous waste collection events too, I would think. Uh, I really appreciate your time, John, and we'll make sure your contact info is shared with everybody. Very good. Anytime. Thank you. Thanks. Karen was just going to do a quick rundown here. OK, I'm just going to touch on one last thing here. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of uh, the uh, special recycling training across the state over the years, and we can still offer that, by the way. But I did want to sort of give you some way to um, keep track of of how to manage these wastes and universal waste all have the sort of the same management standards and this is sort of it in a nutshell and i'm going to date myself right now because um, those of you that may know how to handle something with kid gloves uh, that's the act that's the um, reminder that i'm going to give you here so um for all of these programs, and you know, since my name is is Karen, I think I'm allowed to say that container starts with a K. Yeah, so all uh, universal waste, and especially these programs, all have to be containerized. That's the main thing. They have to be um, containerized, and for not the electronics, but the other ones, they have those boxes need to be closed when you're not putting in. Um, these containers, uh, the Gaylord on the left for the electronics, the paint has the same type of container. Those are picked up by um, a recycler, whereas the rest of them are mail back. All of the containers are here. And then the next thing that you need to remember is that for each container, you need to identify what's in the container. And like the mail back containers are labeled, whereas the electronics one you know you would have to fill that out but they say covered electronic waste the next thing you need to remember is that the date that date that is something that is very commonly a violation that's found every single one of these programs um, you have to write a date when you put the first item into the container to identify that you haven't had it on site for more than one year. A lot of waste, whether you have the label on the product or not, you can get universal waste labels, but if it has a shipping label on it, a lot of them will have the uh, universal waste. You write in or check a box as to what it is, and there's that date. So the one thing that you want to never forget about is the kid. Hopefully that helps. Again, thank you all.
OK, Karen, thank you for that on universal waste. I also just wanted to touch on abandoned household hazardous waste. I'm sure some of you um, discover this when you show up for work, sometimes outside your gate or even throughout the workday. People may sneak this, even though most of your transfer stations do not collect household hazardous waste um, at your transfer station, with the exception of one day household hazardous waste events. Got some old paint, spray cans, things like that. Um, here we've got some batteries piled outside. Now, I would guess that probably customers had left stuff when the operator or the attendant was busy, and then the pile just builds up. Um, this is something we really don't want to see for your own safety and, of course, for the health of the environment. Um, but if you look at the photo on the left there, there's some old rechargeable batteries sitting outside. There was actually a bulging laptop battery in there, um, which is a fire hazard, and it's right next to the propane tank that supplies heat um, for that shed. So we really, that's a situation that needed to be taken care of immediately, um, and they did. They did get that battery in a, in a bucket of sand and then um, are working with Call to Recycle to ship it through the damaged effective recall program that Todd was talking about earlier. If you do find any abandoned household hazardous waste on site at your transfer station, notify your supervisor if you aren't the supervisor yourself. Um, get it into secondary containment if you can. If you that could be something like a Tupperware container or a five gallon pail, um, store it out of the way of anything that's flammable um, and away from customers. If you have a place to put it under cover, please do so. Um, just remember if you put it inside a shed or any kind of shipping container, please make sure it's vented because um, you would never want to put anything that's potentially flammable um, inside a container that's not vented. Just again, some examples you know, of household hazardous waste. What is it? Anything that says caution, warning, toxic, flammable. Even though we can buy this stuff at the hardware store or the grocery store, some of it can be pretty nasty. Um, you know, oven cleaner, I got burnt on that myself years ago when I was a custodian. Um, I was just talking to an operator recently in New Hampshire who got burnt on the skin from it leaking out of the container. Um, so please be careful when you find this stuff and then get it off site as soon as possible to either, if you're fortunate to have a permanent year round facility um, in your region that your solid waste district operates, please contact them and get it to them. Um, if you have to wait for an event, um, Try to, you know, again, talk about, figure out a way to store it safely. We want to get this set, this offsite as soon as possible so you don't have any issues with it. Um, it's also your certification doesn't allow you to store household hazardous waste on site. So we want to stay in line with that. We developed this guidance and I will send out the link to you all um, and or the PDF for this to share with your colleagues and fellow operators on abandoned household hazardous waste. And as always, if you have any questions, call myself or email me um, or any of us on the team about this. And um, and please do connect with your local solid waste management entity to see what your options are for getting any, rid of anything that shows up at your site. All right, and then moving on from questions, we have Frank up next to talk about um, compliance and inspections and, and what he's seen in his visits out to you all. Hello, I hope everybody's doing good today. Uh, my name is Frank Erickson and I work in compliance. So I just want to introduce uh, the compliance team because you probably hear from us every now and again. Uh, I'll start with Cheryl Hamilton, who's responsible for the hauler permitting. Uh, Vince Kiorno, who's uh, in charge of the salvage yard uh, compliance and Barb Schwentner, who's in charge of the, the whole section. And I, I work uh, pretty closely with Barb and Eric Brown, and we, we handle compliance. Uh, a lot of what we do is inspections. Uh, we have periodic inspections. Uh, from time to time, we visit facilities across the state. We try and do this in a way that spreads us out, so we're not focusing on a specific area at any given time. Uh, what we, we normally do, we show up, we see if we can talk to somebody, uh, we, we explain the certification allows us to do these periodic inspections and we we ask for, you know, a walk through the facility. Uh, we, we find that helpful if the operator has the time. Uh, if they don't, then that's that's OK. Um, we can, you know, figure out the general flow of the facility, but it really it really helps when one of yours is there to 
you know, sort of explain uh, how customers come in, how materials are handled, and just sort of give us the rundown of, you know, what what's going on recently and if there's been any problems or any any good things that are going on that, you know, you feel like you're succeeding at. Um, so we we take photos and that creates a record of what we see. Uh, the, the photos are generally a lot better than just uh, notes in a notebook. Um, so just be aware we, we do do that. We don't try to take pictures of, of you know people. We just try to get pictures of the the operation as it's going on. Uh, and then you know usually we we don't give notice for these uh, inspections. Uh, it's better to to do it that way so we get you know our our eyes on the facility when it's you know just a normal regular operating day and so when we're done we provide you with a report usually within about 30 days we'll have a report done another part of our work is uh what i would consider the compliance aspect so uh, helping facilities adhere to the rules and adhere to their permits um, during our our sort of office work once we've done inspections we we run through what we saw, we talk as a team, and we determine uh, whether you know the everything was checked checked off and everything looked good, or if if some corrective actions need to be taken. Um, the other part of what we do then, if if uh, and, and what we do is we we look for voluntary compliance for things that that aren't uh, perfectly in line with the rules and. We ask the facilities to be responsive with with these requests that we do, and um, you know, in rare occasions, we have to do uh, enforcement procedures um, to correct these actions if if the op operators uh, won't do it. Uh, but this is generally pretty rare. Um, and then, yeah, just the last bit I wanted to touch on was that uh, we're the regulator, so we don't really write the laws. Uh, you know, the agency does draft rules. But it's it's our job as a part of the executive branch to create an even playing field to do our best to treat everybody as fairly as possible. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the work the agency's just you know really starting to do with this new environmental justice law. Um, I'm sure this will affect our work in the the coming years. Um, but I just want to put that on everybody's radar. So. When when we're going out, we're inspecting. We see a lot of a lot of things that are uh, you know common amongst facilities across the state, and the tough ones like uh, Karen and was talking about, like lamp storage. You, you gotta you gotta stay you gotta wear your kid gloves um, to to stay compliant with those rules. Uh, batteries is another tough one, uh, and then electronic waste. I, f I find a lot of times that. Uh, you know, it's it's tough, especially with, with without having adequate staff or having staff shortages. When you're you have a, a busy day, there's maybe five customers on site bringing in materials. It's hard to make sure that everybody's putting the stuff in the right containers and that those containers are labeled. If there's a full container and a new one needs to be started, uh, we understand that there's not always time for that, uh, but it is an important thing to to keep track of. Um, Another tricky one is oil collection. Uh, and then the other sort of office ones are reporting and application deadlines. Uh, these ones just sort of get away from you, uh, especially if you're a smaller facility, what we'd call a categorical recycling facility. Uh, you only have to report once a year, which is January 20th, or, or sometimes your certification can uh, indicate a different date. But January 20th is the the, based on the 2020 solid waste management rules, that's the the hard deadline. I think that we're we're applying across the board on new new certifications. Um, so yeah, and then just application deadlines. Most of you have 10 year permits, so you're supposed to reapply uh, where the certification directs you to. However, that can also be in and around six months beforehand. It it varies from certification and certification. So this is one because it's the summertime. Everything's, you know, it's it's hot outside. 
everything gets a little smelly and unfortunately we've been seeing a lot of this and hearing hearing a lot about this with uh you know flies and maggots and bears with food scrap collection um it's it's tough because this one you have to stay stay on top of but some tips here uh we wanted to just outline for you are uh adding sawdust or wood shavings uh what you want to do is have about 50 percent uh, food waste and 50% high carbon material like sawdust. And that way you cover you cover the food scraps so things can't get to them and it provides a, a, a absorbent effect and it keeps down smells, it keeps down the animals. Um, also limiting contaminants. So plastic bags, uh, food stickers, those those food you know on fruits and vegetables, um, good signage and outreach can be a, a way to achieve these uh, these goals and securing your collection containers at the end of the day is, a, is another good one. Uh, I've even seen some facilities use, you know, big metal shipping containers to uh, store their their totes in uh, because they had so many bears. There's uh there's it's it's tough when there's that smell and it goes for miles. Um, and it can also create a nuisance for your neighbors. So I would definitely recommend using uh, as much sawdust as as you think is necessary to get a good cover. Um, you can do this either periodically through the day to keep the, the smells down and to cover the materials, or you can you can instruct the customers if you know if you're dumping in a cup of food scraps, put in a cup of sawdust. Poultry electric fence. A couple facilities have used that. Yeah, yeah. A, a couple facilities have even put in electric fences, um, and a, so a lot of the electric fences people will, will bait as well. So you put some peanut butter on the electric fence. You get a bear that comes and sniffs it. They don't enjoy sniffing the electric fence with the peanut butter on it, and they learn their lesson and they they stay away. Um, so here's some pictures of some facilities that you know, have the sawdust available, they have good signage and have good storage areas for their food scraps. Uh, here's a picture of some poor management. Uh, as you can see, the food waste container is just crawling with maggots. There's cardboard and plastic shopping bags in the food scrap bin. Uh, this is something we we unfortunately encounter every now and again, and it's you know it's it's tough. This is a, a huge part of what what you know used to end up in the landfill, and what still still does end up in the landfill. But it will by by doing this by composting things properly, not not like this, but by composting things properly, uh, we can divert a, a vast amount of. Uh, weight out of the landfill that that will save space in the future and the food waste will be uh, put to a good use it'll become nutrients for uh, soil amendments and it'll be be reused in a, a good way um, you know proper signage isn't always the way to to fix all these issues it, it takes education and outreach um, and monitoring so if if you if you're having trouble with this um, I would definitely recommend to to spend a, a, a bit of time to to go over this with customers and to spend some time monitoring. So. What is an NOAV? This is one of the things we send out pretty frequently if we see things like uh, what I just showed you on that last picture or we see, you know, other things mismanaged labels not. Uh, on the right materials um, or, you know, just violations of your certification. So notice of alleged violation is what we call an NOAV. Uh, we send these out and we send it via certified mail usually and sometimes an email as well. Uh, it provides, provides you with notice about the non-compliance. It provides you with an opportunity to correct it and it provides a timeline to return to compliance with some directives and solutions to the the non-compliance. Uh, generally, we 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 have a uh, team meeting after an inspection, and we'll 
we'll figure out what's the best way to approach the situation and determine if a notice of alleged violation is is necessary. Um, so we we send them out and we generally it's it's about two weeks to a month, depending on the types of uh, violations that we found and how long it might take to correct them. Some things might be there might be like infrastructure that needs to be put in place that wasn't there, like uh, a gate that was required in the certification that just never got built, or it could be um, you know putting food scraps in with the trash, which should be corrected immediately. Uh, so what what I'd recommend if you get an NOIV, um, don't panic, you know, just like you, you have time to fix it. Uh, I'd recommend to be really forward about it. Give us a call, shoot us an email, ask what you can do to 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 do better or to fix the solution, fix uh, the problem, find a solution. Uh, we're definitely here to help with that. Uh, we don't want to we don't send these out to go around like point fingers or, you know, like tell people like you're you know, you're doing bad. It's it's more about like, you know, we're 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 regulating in a way to so we can both do better together. Um, and it provides th these provide a really good opportunity for improvement um, that, uh, you know, I, I'd encourage you to take advantage of uh, when, when you get them. Give, shoot us a call, shoot us an email. We always provide our uh, our contact information on these notices and you can find our information on the solid waste website. So I just want to highlight some deadlines before we take take a look at some some pictures of uh, uh, you know non-compliance. Uh, January twentieth, March thirty first, June thirtieth, August thirty first, and December thirty first. These are when the quarters end and when the annual reports are due. Uh, I'd I'd recommend putting them in your calendar because it they're easy to forget, uh, and we then have to send out. Tons of emails. Quarter two just ended, so we've been reviewing your retract reports uh, this week. So here's a picture of some uh, non-compliance. Here we got lead acid batteries on the ground. Uh, this poses a you know a safety hazard, uh, not just to the the operators, but to the you know the environment around. the The lead acid can leach out. Um, and certain types of batteries that can cause fires. So what you want to do is keep those in the battery storage where they're supposed to be. Um, okay. uh, this one, it, it could have been that, you know, they didn't have the time to to sweep those batteries up during the day. Uh, you know, usually your facility management plan should have an outline to cover uh, how things should be managed. Usually um, materials like lead acid batteries should be handled immediately and put in safe storage areas. Here we got some plastic and yard waste. Uh, this is something we see usually when, you know, like the yard, you know, yard waste storage is often sort of out of sight at a lot of facilities. It's sort of off off to the side or out back. And unfortunately you get people coming in with, you know, things that you, you don't see what they're dumping back there. And here you got food waste in there. There's plastics. There's a recyclable bottle. Here's some improper hazardous waste storage. Um, as you can see, these materials are not labeled. They're not properly containerized and they're not on an impervious surface. Uh, this propose this poses a, a serious safety hazard as well. Um, these things can leak, they can get rained on, and they might not be compatible materials. Where if if something leaked into what the containers below it, it could cause a reaction, cause a fire, create uh, toxic gases. Um, so these things need to be definitely handled safely you got to wear your kid gloves uh Aaron, now i'm stuck on this one i'm going to use it forever now uh so here's more pictures of oil containers used oil containers are are were left open here they were just in in the grass as well 
Um, here's some e-waste storage. Uh, the e-waste isn't protected. It's not under cover. It's not labeled. And here's some mismanaged mercury bulbs. And another example, not labeled, not in the box. Uh, these are things that will will ding you on. We'll we'll have to follow up with an NOAV. And here's some paint storage, not protected from the rain. And here's some e-waste, also not protected from the weather. So if you're having trouble with any of these materials, definitely reach out. If if you think if you see something that doesn't look right, uh, there's probably something you can do to to handle it a, a little better. And you know we're here to help where we can. Uh, feel free to reach out. Again, 802recycles.com, vermontrecycles.com. VOSHA WorkSafe is willing to come out to facilities and do a voluntary visit if you need that. Our contact info, our emails. You can also just email me since you have, and I can get you and anybody else you need, whether it's Frank or Jeff or Todd or John. Um, and again, please let me know any resources you want. We're happy to get them out to you. All right. We're here to help. Call us anytime. That's our job. Thank you so much for attending today.